I'm here with Ben King and Tom Crick. We are here to discuss strength and conditioning for Jiu Jitsu. So on our panel today, we have Ben, who's strength and conditioning coach and my strength and conditioning coach. We've got Tom, who will be giving his input as a recreational grappler. And then uh, myself, where I can give input from a physiotherapist perspective, as well as a competitive grappler. So Lockie is not involved in this one because as most people know from his podcast on his ADC prep, he chooses not to do any strength and conditioning because of the high demands of his wrestling and jiu-jitsu training. So before we start, let's do a quick introduction. So I'm a jiu-jitsu black belt. I'm still a high level competitor. Um, I competed at ADCC in 2019. Uh, I also work as a jiu-jitsu coach and a physiotherapist with a big focus on jiu-jitsu athletes. Uh, ben, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, so I'm a strength and conditioning coach and I've been working with Liv uh, for a couple of years now, but my day job is I work at the Victorian Institute of Sport in Melbourne, Australia. So we work with uh, Commonwealth Games and Olympic hopefuls uh, right down to developing national athletes. So I've had a big focus in combat sports, so jiu-jitsu, wrestling, judo um, and karate. Um, uh, but I have a whole range of other sports that I, I work with every day. So gymnastics, golf, racket sports, including badminton, table tennis, uh, your typical court and field sports like basketball and even some weird stuff like shooting. So I've got a fair, fairly big range. Um, but like I said, I've been working with him for a couple Tom, of years I'm and then we're still working together today. I'm Tom. I'm the head coach for track and field at Aspire Academy in Qatar. It's a big training center in the Middle East focusing on development, developing athletes. But previous to this, I've worked in a few other places in the world, including Northern Ireland. And probably most importantly, I work with British athletics in the run up to the London 2012 Olympics. So I have quite a lot of background in terms of, um, of coaching different types of athletes, and I have previously worked as an SNC coach as well. And I guess uh, also from a jiu-jitsu perspective, I'm a recreational brown belt, and uh, I don't compete, but I, uh, I do jiu-jitsu for um, the love of the sport, and I think like that will be something that as well that's useful because a huge part of our audience will be recreational athletes who are wanting to add SNC potentially to their uh, training programs. So uh, Ben. As a professional SNC coach, you know, you're probably aware of the fact that a lot of SNC coaches don't actually like the term strength and conditioning, and they often prefer to be called physical preparation coaches. Can you briefly explain this issue and, um, and where you stand on it? So I think the issue arises in the fact that we, you know, as an SNC coach, we're judged on our ability to produce a sporting result or assist in producing a sporting result. So what can happen is uh, if an athlete is progressing significantly in the gym but not performing in, on the field, mat, court, or whatever their domain of sport is, um, technically we're not doing our job. Even though our role is being fulfilled, we're not doing our job. So I think that's where the, the lines kind of get crossed a little bit is strength and conditioning in and of itself is great, but our job as SNC coaches is to produce a result. So realistically, you know, any anyone working in a, in a sports uh, preparation team should all be considered sports preparation coaches, but they just have different expertise in each area. Um, so I think that that's where the, like I said, that's where the lines get crossed. Um, and I tend to, I like to have a bit more of an all encompassing ideology, but the way I approach physical preparation is, is there's a start point and an end point. And the end point is a, is a sports specific goal um, and physical preparation will just fit into that as part of other areas of preparation. So technical, tactical um, and emotional mental development. Um, and so I think by taking that lens, it gives us a more kind of a, a wider berth to explore. So it's not just necessarily lifting weights. Like we can explore mobility, we can explore proprioception, energy system, energy system development within the context of their actual sports practice. So I think, yeah, taking a physical preparation lens, I mean, it's, it's terminology in the, at the end of the day. So either way, um, you know, they're both recognizable. You both understand what they're looking at, but. I think physical preparation can allow you potentially to explore a bigger scope and perhaps have a, big, a bigger and better impact on the result at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, the reason that everyone started to move towards the concept of physical preparation initially was because strength and conditioning within that, it only has the word strength and it has the word conditioning. Everyone associates strength with the weight room and they also associate conditioning with the weight room, but maybe also let's say some running training or some cardio or something like this. But physical preparation, as part of your sports preparation overall, you get your technical, your tactical, your physical, your mental preparation. That includes other things. So it includes things like mobility, includes things like proprioception that will not necessarily, uh, if you 
people not necessarily think are, are like part of that of that SNC coach's role, and that's the reason why, as it became a, in my opinion, as it became a career and it became a, a role within within a team, they wanted to become a little bit more all encompassing. And I think it's also very important to consider those points because, uh, like Liv is going to talk about, you know, uh, the role of physiotherapy, and physiotherapy is is one end of the spectrum in relation to physical preparation. So you've got your your traditional SNC coach that might work with athletes that are probably more further further away from being injured whereas uh, uh, physiotherapy might work with someone that is more at the acute uh, stages of injury but of course everyone can have an impact in terms of their physical preparation both an snc traditional coach and a, a physiotherapist within that physical preparation realm and i think that's why people have been moving towards this concept of physical preparation after the uh, over the last few years for sure so, Liv, what do you, how do you see the physio and SNC coach relationship working um, in terms of getting someone just uh, just had an injury to all the way back to either rolling or competition? Mm-hmm. I think it's really important that physio and SNC or any other coach actually work really closely together. Um, I think the big thing, seeing a lot of patients uh, that I find is, for example, I might give a rehab program, uh, which is uh, you know quite common for physios, and I might not be aware that they might have a different program from an SNC coach, and it's actually doubling up the workload, or that the SNC coach might be uh, giving them something they're not quite ready for because we haven't communicated or the patient hasn't passed on the information. So um, I always, from my perspective, it's really, really important that the two parties communicate, whether it's via the patient or directly. Uh, But the way I see a lot of um, acute injury rehab, uh, SNC is pretty much a a continuum of of like injury prevention or rehab into prehab or whatever it might be. So I might take a patient up to a certain point and then they it's a little bit beyond my scope of practice. So I do like to work together with um, strength and conditioning coaches. Yeah, and I would say, Liv, like from my perspective as a head coach or a director of sport within a, an academy setting, for me, the key thing is uh, I have teams. You know, so where I work at the moment, I have teams. I have four essential performance teams. Each of those teams has a coach. Uh, which is work focused mainly on the technical and tactical, although they do go into the physical preparation side of things. Then I normally have an SNC coach. I have a physiotherapist working together, along with other people like biomechanists, biomechanists like psychologists, etc., within that team. And for me, as a performance coach, as someone that's managing that program, for me, it's essential that everybody works together because everyone is responsible for the physical preparation, the athlete, but each of us have different uh, skill sets and, and things that we can bring to the table. And when all of those people are working effectively together, that's where an institute or a professional setup can really add value to the athlete and preparing the athlete. And it's something that you don't get when you're just a one man band, um, you know, in a, uh, in a, in a not like a, a less professional uh, a setup. And I think that's something that you at uh, Absolute MMA are starting to try and to work towards a little bit. And that's why you have your, you know, you have your coaching, you have your physiotherapist, you have your SNC all combined together. Yeah, it's definitely hard when there's not an institute or a, a team that actually comes together. Um, I think number one thing is that it's actually expensive for a lot of people to to have different people involved. And then also having the time for everyone to meet and communicate and, and come for the best um, program or the best outcome for the for the client or the patient. And actually, that kind of brings us on to something that I thought was kind of interesting. So in my last podcast with Lockie, we talked about his ADCC preparation. And we also talked about the fact that he doesn't actually do S&C. And the, and the main reason why he doesn't do that is because he was spending a massive amount of time focused on his, his wrestling. Uh, and wrestling is extremely is extremely tiring, but it also uh, has a, a high physical preparation demand. You know, the, a, a lot of the shots, a lot of the, the way you move, etc. that also develops him as an athlete. Uh, and so he doesn't have necessarily, he felt that if he added extra SNC into his program, he wouldn't be able to train his wrestling and jiu-jitsu as much as possible. So for himself, he believed that the, the, the SNC as a separate entity wasn't something that he needed to focus on uh, at, at his stage in his career. However, Ben, what would you say would be some of the uh, benefits of, of doing physical preparation at, away from the mats? And also, do you see SNC as being essential for grapplers? How do you see all that thing together? So I think logically, if SNC was essential, um, Lockie wouldn't be able to exist or have done what he did at ADCC. So 
like logically speaking, um, no, it's it's not essential, but I think it can be very useful. And I would argue that's that's very true of a lot of sports. Some SNC might become more essential, but certainly in a sport like jiu-jitsu with so many avenues to success and so many different ways to leverage your body and position um, against your opponent, it, it, it's not essential, um, but it, it definitely can be useful. So I think uh, there's different populations which we'll get in, in, into later on, but an analogy that I would use is you're, you're baking a cake. So your, your, your basics of a cake, eggs, flour, you know, cocoa, whatever it is, that's jiu-jitsu training and that's the basics. You need that in place if you're going to have a good cake. s c is just like the icing that goes on top, right? So if the cake is shit, then it's just going to be covered in icing and it's not going to be good for anyone. So um, you're better off focusing on the basics first, exactly what Lockie did and got them all in the right place. And he's obviously a world-class coach and competitor, so he knows how to make it right. It doesn't need any icing. It's perfect the way it is. So, you know, in many cases, less is more. Um, but I definitely think that the icing can make the cake better and SNC can make uh, grappling performance better if if done correctly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the, the key point. And, and you mentioned a bit about it, about it there, but like, um, uh, I guess there were some specific uh, populations in which in, uh, for which SNC would probably be more um, you know, be more important. Um, could you know? Could you give me some ideas about what kind of populations you think they may be? Well, it's it's funny because Liv actually fits into two of the three that we've discussed um, off air. But uh, particularly, like injury history is going to be the big flag first of all. If you've had a previous injury and you want to either keep that injury away or um, sort of progress past the point where you're hampered by the, that injury, um, you're using exercise as medicine is a really helpful concept. And I think one of the things that I've stolen from a coach. Um, in in the states, Eric Cressy is what gets you healthy, keeps you healthy. So you know, with live with a, a particular knee injury, doing similar programs that she'd done when she was rehabbing just keeps keeps it feeling secure and tight, so she can stay on the mat and do more work. Um, so I think yeah, anyone with an injury history or predisposed to injuries, um, which you know, relatively speaking, is is most people, if not all, um, and particularly with a, a combat sport, you're going to be exposed to bumps and bruises. So, yeah, anyone with the injury history. Um, I think the second category is, is female athletes. Um, and I, I'll get you to touch on that, Tom, but we've kind of discussed the benefits that we can see uh, from doing strength training with females. In my experience, female athletes, they definitely can seriously benefit from strength and conditioning. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the, the key reasons for it is that um, unlike male athletes, when female athletes go through uh, puberty, um, they their strength levels increase, but at some point their uh, their body mass tends to increase as well because women tend to hold a little bit more fat than men. And there's quite a lot of studies, especially in the area of um, ACL reconstruction, that show that if a female athlete only trains in their sport, and, and typically these studies are done in uh, field sports like you know, soccer, things like this, then actually their strength levels don't tend to increase from doing their sport. And they uh, and therefore, uh, as that's completely the opposite for men, right? Men, if they continue to play their sport, their strength levels tend to increase uh, uh, as well. And so that st- additional strength is, is really important for specifically for um, helping them to guard against ACL injuries. And that's where the research is done. But I think it also translates to many other, other areas. And as well as that, we have the health issues f- for female athletes. Strength and conditioning, building muscle mass is good for bone health, which we know is really super important for girls. You know, it, it develops that uh, that overall muscular uh, strength, which can help protect them from injuries as well. Because girls tend to have a little bit wider hips; they tend not to be as strong in the upper body, and therefore, it's, it, it, for me, it, it, it's a really important thing. And I've seen, you know, I've worked with a lot of female athletes, and I've seen some absolutely huge improvements in in physical performance that can occur occur from females. I'm not saying they don't occur for males; of course, they do as well. But it's just so noticeable for female athletes, and not only does it help with their sport but it also helps with their their life long term and i feel like uh, especially in your late teens uh, and 20s uh, for any age but especially in those areas as a female athlete if you're doing jiu-jitsu and you can uh, get a bit of physical preparation there as well then that's going to help you out for the rest of your your life as well and it will make jiu-jitsu uh, safer for you so that would be my kind of my feeling from a, a female athlete perspective so from a jiu-jitsu perspective um what i would add is different weight divisions might have slightly different uh, requirements. So the lighter weight competitors, maybe from rooster weight to lightweight, uh, probably would benefit less from like strength gains and more from mobility um, 
or a lot of mobility. The the guards that lighter players seem to sorry, the guards that lighter fighters seem to play are definitely a lot more flexibility based, um, and you're going to get more bang for your buck concentrating on that. Whereas I think definitely in the higher weights, the heavyweights uh, strength plays a, a big part, you know, staying on top and, and having really good pressure. So uh, I think it's maybe slightly more important in the heavier weights. The One of the novel concepts that I hadn't considered before, uh, particularly with working with heavier guys, um, is that if you're the heaviest guy in the gym, there's no one heavier than you to fight against. So you're going to have to supplement that weight with a different weight, where if you're uh, sort of a, a, an average weight or as lives at a lighter fighter, you're going to have ample opportunity to fight people that are above your weight. So you're getting a strength stimulus, where if you're literally the biggest mm -hmm. and heaviest guy, there's not there's nowhere to go. You're at the top. Um, so you're going to have to look elsewhere to get that stimulus. Yeah, Ben, I totally agree. And this is something as um, as a coach that like my, my expertise is, uh, is not so much in strength conditioning, but it's in seeing the whole program. And I think a different perspective that I will give is I'll give the perspective of someone looking across the whole program. So I'm thinking when I'm looking at a program about, okay, during that jujitsu training that person is doing, what physical qualities are they developing? And if you are a lightweight athlete, let's just say you are a 60 kilogram fighter, you're probably rolling with a lot of much heavier fighters all the time, which means you're going to get a higher strength stimulus from jujitsu than someone that's 120 kilograms that's fighting mainly let's say with 80 or 90 kilogram athletes and therefore for them the physical stimulus won't necessarily be as much it might be higher from a cardio perspective because maybe the smaller athletes faster but from a strength perspective it's not going to be enough and so i think if you're a heavyweight fighter and you're going to fight other heavyweight athletes and you're not getting that stimulus from jiu-jitsu then you're going to need to supplement it somewhere else and again like if we go back to Lockie's case you know he's in the 77 kilogram uh, category he's probably often fighting athletes that are heavier in training and therefore he's going to get a lot of strength stimulus from that so it's like what can you get from your training program and then how can you supplement that with things off the mat and so for each athlete in each different category depending on the individual circumstances will change whether or not uh, snc is as is beneficial for one thing or for another that's why it's difficult for us to answer that question is jiu-jitsu essential for grappling and is it essential uh, for a specific uh, athlete in a spe in a specific uh, situation and if we just go back to that question, you know, I'm always looking across the program and looking at what physical components can be developed by what different training methods. And some bits of jujitsu may be great for developing one area, but they might not be enough to develop in, in another, area, as we talked about. And so I think, you know, having that physical, that physical training uh, from physical preparation, it can develop strength qualities. It can develop power qualities that you just can't develop on the mat. However, let's just say if you're doing a lot of wrestling, well, maybe that wrestling training is developing some of those qualities. So therefore, certain elements of strength conditioning won't be as important. And, and it's, it's about looking at that whole program and trying to work out what's happening that's important. And if I was a, an SNC coach listening to this, this would be the key thing that I would take away from, from, this, uh, from this podcast would be that you need to look across the training program. You need to see how things uh, are working and what qualities are being developed within the sporting context. And then you can look at where you can supplement and, and what you can do and how you can be of use. And... And that's where the, the professional coach, the, the person that has the years of experience will be able to help. Whereas they, uh, somebody else, you know, who's just coming in doing it, um, you know, more recreationally might not have that perspective. And, and that's where you can definitely get a benefit of working with professionals that have experience from different sports and have experience from different populations. Because they, they see those pathways and those connections that, that other people um, might not necessarily have. Yeah, I agree with all those things. And I think a couple of, just to kind of summarize a little bit is, the purpose of doing SNC in, in grappling will be increasing your physical outputs or your neuromuscular outputs, um, which will therefore as a byproduct will increase your injury mitigation. Um, so you're less likely to get injured, um, which therefore equals more time on the mat and, and then you, increases your ability to execute other skills or positions or just train more. Um, you know, we all know that there's a, there's a certain time course that takes to develop any sports skill, but Jiu Jitsu takes a long time to learn. So spending more time on the mat and being executed at a higher level will increase and will in increase your ability to execute skills and shorten the amount of time it'll take to reach those next levels. So having touched on the benefits of, uh, of SNC, are there other negative factors as well in terms of focusing on strength conditioning for jiu-jitsu? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think once you get an idea of, of where it fits into the physical performance picture, um, and you're spending way too much time on SNC and it's taking away from your time on the mat, you know, that's just spending uh, energy and time inefficiently where you could be redirecting it towards 
um, you know, sports performance and grappling performance. So spending it inefficiently, spending it ineffectively can have a negative effect and put you a high, at a higher risk of being injured because you're exhausted, you're coming into a hard session, um, you're coming into competition rounds. And if you're not at your freshest, that's when there's a chance that things can go wrong. Um, and I think the other key part is if you're coming into the sport, and I certainly experienced this myself as a very, very novice grappler, but you can get away with certain things by perhaps being a little bit stronger and it doesn't give you the chance to struggle and learn positions and keep calm because you can kind of, I always found myself rolling and just kind of wriggling my way out. And I knew that wasn't correct, but I was just trying my best to survive. And perhaps I wasn't learning the technique correctly because then I could just get my way out of a position. But at the further and more advanced fighters I ever rolled with would just completely mitigate any strength that I had. So I think at a lower level, you need to kind of be stuck in the muck a little bit. You need to, to work your way up. Um, and you need to, to struggle to advance, uh, where if you're super strong, super powerful, you'll just dominate. It's like the, it's like the kid that comes up and plays basketball that's six foot six and he's taller than everyone. And then all of a sudden he gets to 18, 20 and everyone's his size again and he sucks because he's never learned the skills. He's never had to struggle to, to, to win. And, and there goes that, but it's always the kid who's the smallest and has to fight the hardest to learn the skills and all of a sudden he has a growth spurt and he takes all that on and, and goes on to future success. So I think, yeah, spending too much time on it is like making making a profit on your vending machine, but your company going broke and being too strong when you start is like being a tall kid that beats everyone up. So I think, yeah, if, if you're focusing too far away, too far away from where you should be, um, then you're, you're losing sight of the, the whole picture. Yeah. And I think from my perspective, I think this is something that, that's important, right? So you need to have enough physical preparation to be able to undertake the training that you want to do. So if you're training two or three times a week, you need to be fit enough to be able to do that. But it doesn't necessarily help you in the long run to be super, super strong because if you develop your physical qualities too much, then as you said, it just becomes something that you rely on and stops you from necessarily learning your technique. If I was to take an athlete from, let's say, 12 years old through to being a world champion, and I, you know, they were working in an institute situation, which is what you work with every day, I'd want to develop their physical qualities in line with what they need to be able to undertake their technical qualities. In track and field, there are some things you just can't do if you're not strong enough. So we get to a point where it's like we have to increase strength before you're able to achieve these things. As well as a classic example, they've got the long jump, right? In the long jump, you see them taken off and they do these big like movements in the air with their arms and stuff. That's only possible if you can jump a certain distance because you have to be in the air long enough to be able to do that. So you have to develop those uh, that physical speed and those qualities before you can like really learn the landing and things like this. You can't do that when you're 10 years old. You can't learn the landing and long jump because you just can't be in the air long enough. So you can find other ways to teach that stuff, but you basically can't do it. So you have to develop the physical qualities uh, when the athlete is ready to, to, to learn something, something else. But at the same time, um, I want to develop everything together at the right at the right point, and I definitely would want to develop the strength as you go through. And I think you see this with a lot of good grapplers. I mean, let's just take Craig Jones, just because most people know him. I go back and I look at some of his old, old videos, and this guy is so uh, skinny. You know that he yeah. probably wasn't using strength as his main factor. Yes, he has long levers. Yes, he was probably relatively relatively strong, but it wasn't a key factor. Whereas now, when I see him compete, I'm like, wow, this guy is. You know, he looks like a track and field athlete to, in, in my perspective. He's got long arms, got long legs. And it's also the same with someone like Gordon Ryan. You see, he's, his his physical mass has increased as he's got as he's got better, which means he allowed him to learn the technique first, and then develop the strength to go along with that, which then made him better. And compare this completely with someone like Nicky Rod, right? So, Nicky Rod, he's already a physical specimen, and now he's trying to learn the technique. And I'm interested with with him. I think his biggest challenge will be learning to use his technique when he already has his strength that allows him to compete at a high level. Will he be as effective at, at learning technique uh, because he already has these strength qualities in place? It's, 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 you know, it's going to be interesting. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that, I think, but I think that'll be a main challenge for someone like that as opposed to someone who's coming through and developing their, their technique and their strength together. Liv, what, what do you think? Because as a girl, I know you're very physically strong. It probably gave you an advantage at, at lighter weights, but how do, you, how do you see that now and how do you see it fitting in as you've, as you've got up, your, up the belts and are now at like the elite level? Yeah, well, when I started, um, I came off probably 11 years or 12 years of gymnastics and six years of sprint cyclists, uh, sprint cycling. So um, in sprint and cycling, I was very strong. I was quite powerful. I had big legs and I definitely kind of like what you were saying, Ben, I, I think my first coach actually banned me from like doing submission submissions in my first like six months. Um, 
and using my strengths just so I'd actually learn the skills. So I stopped like any lifting after I stopped cycling, but I was still relatively strong for my size. And I think I always have been, maybe not not for featherweight, but for light feather and rooster, I've always been quite strong. Um, but that's never, ever, ever been my main focus. In saying that, um, I think at the highest level, if I can win because I'm a little bit stronger than someone when the skill is equal, I think that's a massive advantage. Uh, but I also don't feel like I've ever lost a match because I wasn't strong enough in my in my weight class anyway. I think it does, you know, when someone's 10, 15 kilos heavier, I think it starts getting extremely difficult for me. Uh, not impossible, but then your skill has to be way higher. So I do think it helps. Uh, I definitely think, you know, if, I can be bothered taking the time out to get stronger or more flexible or fitter and work on my skill at the same time. It all comes together, same as your strategy and your mental state. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, it's an excuse that, oh, like, but someone's way stronger than you. I think your your technique should be able to, um, to overrule the strength. But yeah, going back to your question, I've never really... Uh, I never concentrated on getting stronger. It was always more of a rehab, keeping myself healthy, keeping myself on the mat. And probably that's changed a little bit in lead up to ADCC where I actually tried to get bigger and stronger because I had to, because there's no lower weight division. But um, yeah, it just helps me being on the mat and helps me uh, learn better jiu-jitsu. I think Lockie's the perfect example of this and his performance at ADCC, right? Like he kept, and this is the point I would want to make to, to all grapplers is, keeping the main thing, the main thing, like the main thing is grappling. The main thing is wrestling. The main thing is like finding advantages over your opponents. And if, if S and C was this great big advantage that, you know, if you just focused all your time and, and energy into it, then what Lockie did against guys that were 20, 30 kilos heavier than him, just, it wouldn't be possible. Um, so I think that there's a, there's nuance in this discussion. There's a gray area where it can be effect. It can be really effective, but it's, it's not the main thing. It's not yeah. gonna win you a championship, but if you're not doing it and you're physically not up to scratch, it yeah. might lose you one. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think it sometimes is a little bit of what you enjoy as well. Like Lockie hates it, he hates running. He pretty much just loves jujitsu. And that's like <laughs> the only exercise he really enjoys. You know, like sometimes we'll in isolation, so we've gone for a bike ride and he can tolerate it. Whereas I, I don't mind. I actually like the like feeling of getting stronger and lifting. It's like a little challenge within myself and I enjoy it as long as I do it for a sport. Like I, I hate going to the gym if I didn't do jujitsu just for, you know, to deadlift or to look better or something. But um, yeah, I think it does come down to what you can tolerate and what you enjoy as well. Yeah. And that's especially important as a, as a recreational grappler. And I think in, in some of the previous podcasts, I've lucky we spent a massive amount of time talking about goal setting and you know, there may be certain people out there that definitely, for them, the, the gap between where they are now and where they need to be in order to perform it will be strength and conditioning, will be strength, or maybe will be mobility. And in which case, those things then become super important because they have to close that gap, otherwise it's not going to win. So as a classic example for myself, as a recreational grappler, the reason I'm not really competing is because I lack fun the fundamental mobility that is needed to perform at a high level in jiu-jitsu. And therefore, I have to use a game that, that deals with the fact that I'm just limited in my mobility. To be an elite level athlete, if I really wanted to get there, I'd have to make huge improvements in my in my, in my my mobility. And that would be something that as a coach, I would be saying to myself, hey, you need to do this. But as a recreational rappler, I'd rather just uh, 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 adjust my game and, and fit around my, my limitations. So, you know, it's, it's finding that gap and working on it. And if SNC is the key thing that will help you to do that, if uh, physical preparation is that, then that's something you need to work on. If it's not, then there might be other areas that, that, that you can get better at. I, I do also think you have to always be asking yourself, you know, even if you want to be a world champion, is it worth, like, if you keep stretching into a range that you just don't have, is that worth possibly winning a medal? You know, like sometimes you just can't do it. I know, um, actually, this is a great example. My toes just don't bend because they're really athletic. So my passing is limited in, in a sense that I'm really flat footed. And um I did a training camp with Bruno Malpassini. So Ben Bruno is a 10 time world champion. He's a rooster weight, amazing rappler. He's got amazing mobility. And um, I said, what could you change? Because I actually can't bend my toes. I can't push off that way. What can I change? And he just looked at me going stretch. And I said, well, if I stretch, I can't walk the next day. Like I literally can't walk. And he said, well, you just don't want to be a world champion enough. 
And I said, well, yeah, maybe you're right. <laughs> like I do, but actually that's my limit. I, I want to be able to walk when I'm 40 in five years, four years. Um, you know, that, so there is a limit to it. It's not all about winning that medal. You have to consider your body and your future and permanent damage you must be, you might be causing yourself. Yeah, and I think we, we need to spend, we'll spend a little bit of time later talking about uh, mobility. And then when we talk about that, we'll also go into some of those uh, those key points. That's a great a great example of where there's certain things that you can improve and there's certain things that you can't in that situation. Like it's not that you don't want to improve the mobility in your toes. It's that it's physically impossible for you to maintain the mobility. So you have to ad- adapt to that by doing something different. Yeah. And that's a key thing that I think is important. And it's why working with a professional can be very useful. Because if you, if you didn't know that, if you didn't know that you had a bone spur in your toe, you could try and improve it. And actually, as we'll talk about, you know, as we can talk about improving that range of motion, actually just bangs those bones together more, which causes more bone growth, which causes a reduction in, a, could cause a reduction in, a, in flexibility rather than an improvement. Um, so, um, yeah, something that's uh, definitely worthwhile thinking about. Yeah, I think the great, the great secret of elite sport is it's not healthy surprisingly <laughs> it's, it's being really an elite not. athlete being an elite athlete uh, doesn't uh, go hand in hand with living a long and healthy life you might live <laughs> to be very old but uh, and i'm sure some element of it will be uncomfortable especially in a sport where the whole goal is to leverage one of your joints until it's too painful to continue so i'm sure there's uh, a relative amount of wear and tear that comes with that Absolutely. But I do think with Jiu Jitsu, it's one of those sports that, you know, a lot of elite athletes after they're done with the competitive career retire because I, I mean, I might be wrong, but it'll be very hard to keep sprinting on the on the track till you're, you know, 60. But I do think I, I really genuinely believe you can keep rolling till, um, you know, till your body can't go anymore. And it might be well into your 60s. Uh, or, or we've got some people training you know, in the seventies as well. Um, and I think for me, I love it so much. I want to be on the mats for a very long time. And of course everyone has different goals, but it's entirely possible with jujitsu. If you do, if you, if you're smart about your training. So we've talked about some of the positives and some of the potential drawbacks, uh, you can see from applying S and C to your grappling career. But Tom, when people come to you and, and ask about physical preparation, you know, where, where do you see that kind of applying and, and how would you apply that in someone's uh, training environment? Yeah, so when you come to actually, uh, uh, you know, you, you have your goal, right? So the whole idea about physical preparation is you're going you're gonna to have your goal. You're going to come and you're going to say, I want to increase my muscular strength or I want to increase my range of motion or my mobility um, or I want to uh, increase the, uh, my ability to, to train for longer, for example, right? So you have your goal. But then the methods that most people think about when they think about SNC is they think about going to the weight room using kettlebells, using dumbbells, using, um, you know, uh, like barbells and stuff like this, right? Or maybe using a, a, a ski erg or a rower. And, and the point that I want to make very quickly is that um, physical preparation, and the reason I like the word physical preparation is that, is that you can use almost anything to improve your physical preparation. So as a classic example, if you were to go back and look in the history of, uh, of training for different sports, Back in the old days in track and field, in the 1920s, the 1910s, uh, in the off season, which was basically the th- there was a three month or so uh, competitive season, in the off season, people you didn't used to necessarily train for track and field in the off season. They would go and do other sports in order to improve their physical preparations. They might go and do alpine skiing, for example, if, as an endurance athlete, in order to improve uh, improve their aerobic capacity. Um, they they might go and um, lift lift weights with a weightlifter in order to improve their their strength. And so all the methods of physical preparation typically come from other sports. So anything that you can do in a different sport, you can use as a method of preparation for your sport. And, you know, so from a jujitsu perspective, if you came and you came and trained with me, your track and field, I can improve your strength, your mobility, your, uh, your, um, your aerobic capacity, your anaerobic capacity, uh, or I can do all those things by having you train for track and field. And, but of course, with associated with training for track and field, there'll be a number of uh, injury, potential injury risks that you could have. So as an SNC coach, what you're doing is you're picking certain elements from different sports, from different places, uh, and you're putting them together into a physical preparation program for someone do, doing, doing their own sport. And so that's what you see. So you'll see within SNC, you'll see, uh, you'll see elements of bodybuilding. You'll see elements of, uh, of, of, of weightlifting, the, the Olympic weightlifting sport. You'll see elements of powerlifting. You'll also see running elements, for example, that might be taken from track and field. Um, you might see like a, a skier, which is taken from alpine skiing or a rower, which is taken from the, the sport of rowing. So all these things can be taken and used together 
as part of your physical preparation for your sport. And actually, you see you see now a lot of uh, S&C coaches will start taking elements of jiu-jitsu and applying them uh, for other sports. So, for example, there might be different crawling activities, different things like this um, that they could use for developing certain qualities within, within other sports. And actually, it was interesting when I was in Northern Ireland, the Gracie Baja gym there, they worked with Ulster Rugby and they actually taught them um, jiu-jitsu at, at a basic level. They taught them jiu-jitsu because these are contact rugby players that uh, are needing to you know, hold somebody, hold them down, learn to apply their, their weight. So they were using jiu-jitsu as a form of physical preparation preparation for rugby. And we mustn't lose sight of this. It's very easy to think you need to go in the gym and do something. But there could be another sport that you play or elements of another sport that you've done in the past that you could use in your physical preparation. So with Liv, for example, I heard that she's a cyclist. And if I was wanting to improve her aerobic conditioning, let's say, I might decide that I put her on the bike to do aerobic conditioning rather than make her do running as, as a classic mm-hmm. example, right? So you can use other sports to do that. And I think that's something that, that's really important. Having said that, Ben, as a professional S&C coach, what would be the key methods that you would be using in order to improve someone's physical preparation? What would be some of the classic standard things that you'd be doing? I think, as you just said, Tom, like the, the principles, are, the, the common saying is methods are many, but principles are few. And I think if you've got your principles, you've got your approach kind of nailed down, then the methods will just appear themselves. They may look very similar to another program written, but as long as you can justify why it's in the program and it follows a really logical process of, yes, I've, I've chosen to do a squat or a heavy deadlift or a kettlebell swing or stuff that you'll find in any gym kind of across you know Australia or the world. But if you can justify why it's there and you can go through the why process and someone can keep badging you, ask you why five times, why is it there? What's it doing? What's it for? And you can keep justifying that, then I think, you know, that's that's the power of, of an SNC. That's the power of physical prep. So for me, working with any athlete, um, I'll identify who the athlete is, um, identify the sport demands, assess the difference and what the strength and weaknesses are of that person and then apply the training craft. So typically like resistance training will be the mainstay um, and, and I tend to lean towards kind of barbell training for, for my, own, uh, my own athletes. Um, I think it's safe, scalable. There's heaps of variations you can do and strength as a physical quality uh, underpins a, a, a number of other physical outputs. So, you know, you, you'll see, and you would have seen Tom with a lot of athletes with the junior athletes, if you just get them stronger, all of a sudden they'll move a little bit quicker. They'll jump a little bit higher. Um, they'll be a little bit more powerful. So just having good, strong foundation uh, kind of underpins a whole number of other qualities. Plus there's like an element of um, injury mitigation that comes from that as well. So it's like y- your classic exercises like bench press, chin ups, squats deadlifts etc etc like they're all um you know well known and they're the things i'll gravitate towards but it's it's in the the process of applying um that will be you know that'll be the magic i just wanted to touch on what you said before because connor evans the wrestling coach at absolute was working with the melbourne rebels so the super rugby team in melbourne and you know going through uh tackling techniques and one of their, their tactical elements was out of a um out of a ruck they wanted to stand up as quick as they could. So using sprawling methods, which mm. essentially is staying off tackle on your feet and getting back up as quick as you can. So they were applying those methods. And I, one of the best sessions I did uh, last year was with my golf squad. I brought them to jiu-jitsu gym and made them do jiu-jitsu. And it was way outside their comfort zone. Um, but these are guys that are well-trained. Like they've, they've been in the gym for five, six years. Um, but we they all walked out with something, not only like from the, I guess, like the mental, emotional element of it something outside their comfort zone but from a physical perspective um you know as a stimulus they had not felt before and they got a lot out of it so um you know as you said like uh, that crawling uh grappling tackling is starting to spread its way more and more into into sport and i think you know i think it's only a good thing so i think this is a good place to recap on what we discussed so far and summarize some of the key take-home messages the first thing to remember is that the role of snc is to improve sports performance Yes, SNC can be a key part of an athlete's physical preparation, but it's also important to understand that as a jiu-jitsu practitioner, your physical preparation also occurs on the mat as well as in the gym. So any work that you do off the mat, whether it be in the gym or out running or whatever it's going to be, must complement what you do on it. And if you think about the people that would ideally be involved in a program, the jiu-jitsu coach, the strength and conditioning coach, and the physiotherapist all have a role to play when it comes to physical preparation. Therefore, it's important that in an ideal world, they're all talking to each other and are being careful not to overdo training in a specific area. For example, training grip strength in jiu-jitsu as well as training in SNC could lead to an overuse injury in the fingers. 
probably one of the most important take-home messages is that SNC away from the mats is not necessarily essential for jiu-jitsu because of the high technical and tactical emphasis of the sport. However, SNC is arguably more important for some groups than others. For example, women, injured or injury-prone athletes, and athletes in heavier weight categories. Ultimately, any extra strength conditioning done away from the mat should allow you to get more out of the time that you spend doing jiu-jitsu and help minimize injury risks so that you can train more consistently. It's also important to recognize that strength conditioning can have some negative effects as well, especially if you spend too much time and energy on it. Any extra time that you spend doing strength conditioning could be time you could spend recovering. And if you're not fully recovered for jiu-jitsu, this can increase the chances of injury on the mat. When it comes to training methods that are available to improve your physical preparation for jiu-jitsu, there literally are endless options, from classic weight room exercises with barbells and kettlebells and dumbbells, to cardio exercises, or even other sports. The choice comes down to your goals and the constraints you have from the equipment that is available. A good strength and conditioning coach should be able to get excellent results, almost regardless of what the circumstances are. So hopefully you enjoyed the discussion today, and we'll tune in next time when we'll answer questions on strength and conditioning for jiu-jitsu sent to us via Instagram. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and remember to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you get notifications whenever Lockie and Liv release new content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.